So hi everyone, my name is Nikita. I'm a PhD student at the Robotic Systems Lab uh, from ETH Zurich. In this talk, I'll show you how we used Isaac Jim to train our animal robot to work on rough terrain with perceptive inputs while massively reducing the training time. So reinforcement learning has been used before for this type of task. So walking on rough terrain with the, the same robots. Uh, it has actually shown very good results, both with blind policies and uh, with perceptive inputs. But a common issue is the long training times. So as you can see in the blind case, it, it took 12 hours to train. But once you add perceptive inputs, the training times blow up. And now they, it's many, many days. And so now with the Isaac Gym pipeline, we can train thousands of robots in parallel. And we actually achieve a fully trained policy in 20 minutes that we can deploy on the real robot. And again, using perceptive inputs. So I'll first start by describing the task in more detail. The, so the policy has to follow base velocity commands uh, that are randomized during training. And it has to do this while walking on uh, various types of terrains. The commands include X and Y linear velocity of up to one meter per second, and your angular velocity up to 1.5 radians per second. To achieve this, it gets multiple observations. So it gets commands, base and joint states, and it also receives height measurements of the terrain at selected points around the robot's base. So here they're presented in yellow, and there are these points. And we also give it its own previous actions, which seem to help a lot during training. The actions are joint position targets sent to a PD controller, which produces torques. For the rewards, the main two components are the tracking of the linear and angular commands, but we also ask the policy to minimize joint velocity, acceleration, torques, quick changes in actions, and reduce collisions on the knees and shanks of the robot. And finally, the purely for cosmetics, we ask it to do larger steps, which produces more visually appealing gates. On this slide, you can see the four types of terrain that we use. So we have uneven surfaces, slopes with up to 25 degrees, stairs with a height of 20 centimeters, and randomized obstacles with heights of up to plus minus 20 centimeters. And as you can see, the stairs and slopes are organized in pyramids such that the robots can walk in all directions without crashing. The terrains are also styled side by side. So if one of the robots leaves the terrain, it will just enter the next one and, and can continue training. We found it very useful to train first on simple versions of the terrains before increasing that difficulty. And so we created what we call a game-inspired curriculum in which the trains are separated into levels. So it's a bit hard to see, but the trains close to the camera here are much simpler than the ones far away. So in particular, we increase the step height of stairs and obstacles and the angle of the slopes. At the beginning of training, all the robots start in the middle of the very first level. And then if one of them manages to escape its square, at the next reset, it will start from the, for the, from the next level. And this process continues. So as you can see, at the, after just a few iterations, the robots only explored the very first part. But then in the middle of training, they actually went much further into the map. Interestingly, this shows us which terrains are difficult and which ones are easier. So actually here, you can see that walking on uneven surfaces and climbing slopes, as well as descending um, stairs is much easier than crossing randomized trains or climbing stairs. And as a side note, when a robot leaves the, so solves the very last train, its level is randomized, so it will start wherever uh, on the map. So at the end of training, what you see is this. So all robots are spread across the map and they have explored the, the full complexity of the trains. Uh, since we want to deploy on the real robot, we have to add a few elements to the task. So we add noise with an amount based on real data. We also randomize the friction coefficient of the ground because it's hard to predict what ground the robot will walk on. We push the robots during the episode, which forces the policy to adopt more stable and robust gates. And finally, um, our robot uses series elastic actuators with a spring inside, which are fairly hard to model. So we train a neural network on real data from the robot, and then we add this neural network inside the simulation to produce torques from um, joint position history targets. So now I can show you the results. First, in simulation, as you'll see, the robots can walk across all of the trains. 
and they're pretty good at keeping the, the at working with the, the commanded velocity. And here, this is shown by the fact that they're synchronized together as well as with the camera. Uh, if we if we dig a, a little bit further, we can see that on stairs, for example, we have a 98% success rate on the hardest uh, terrain type that we train on. And now we can also deploy it on the real robots. And it works. So it can climb stairs. And it can cross these obstacles. And actually, it was never trained on these moving uh, obstacles. It, it struggles a bit. But as you'll see, it recovers and it doesn't fall. And in a more challenging scenario, you have these longer stairs. And there, just to be safe, David is ready to catch it, but it's not actually helping the bot at the moment. Right, so on this slide, uh, I'll show a few insights into the training plans. So the first plot shows the different subparts of every environment step. So in order, you have to do simulation, the inference of our actuator network, which is a neural network representing the motors of the, the robot, compute observation that rewards, and infer the policy. And as you can see, the simulation is the takes the most time. We, when you increase the number of robots, uh, all the times increase, but interestingly, and very importantly, they, they don't scale linearly. So for example, if you go from 4,000 robots to 8,000, the simulation time increases, but it, it doesn't double, which means that the overall throughput increases a lot. And on the bottom plot, now I'm showing the total time it takes to do a policy update, which involves collecting 100,000 robot steps and then doing the backpropagation of the, the policy. And here very, you can clearly see that Increasing the number of robots helps a lot to re in reducing the iteration time, and which means you also reduce the total training time. And so with 4,000 robots, we can train a policy for 1,500 iterations, which is when it achieves convergence in about 20 minutes. All right, I'll just like to add a few tips and tricks that I've learned throughout this work that hopefully can help you optimize your own pipelines later on. When you work with trains, it's very important not to regenerate trains during training. Instead, as I showed before, you, I create a huge map, and then I just move the robots around on that map. And actually, having these huge maps uses more memory of, of the GPU, but it doesn't really increase the computation cost, which is very beneficial. Whereas if you wanted to recreate, uh, recite, and regenerate the trains during runtime, this, was, this would be very costly. Also, it's, it's good to increase the resolution. Uh, I mean, no, lower the resolution, sorry, as much as possible for the train. So reduce the density of points. And for this, I had to use a triangle mesh instead of a height field in order to achieve uh, acceptable vertical surfaces. Otherwise, you see that stairs are look like slopes and the robots won't learn properly. Then uh, contact handling is also very important for simulation performance. So you should only keep necessary collision bodies. For our robot, we keep the feet, shank, knees, and base, and all other collisions are ignored because you don't need them for training. Finally, a slightly stranger trick is that it's good to spread the robots far away from each other and not have them all in the same spot. Because actually in Isaac Gym, especially with the physics engine, uh, even though the collisions between the robots are ignored, they're still detected. So if you have all the robots in the same spot, to increase a lot the collision filtering cost. And you can see uh, up to a factor of two of difference between having all the robots together or spread them far away. Finally, my last tip is to trust the implementation of PyTorch. So at first, I was a bit worried that some parts of the pipeline would be very slow, like inference of the actuator network, for example. But actually, even with 4,000 robots and a two layer LSTM, so 4,000 robots means you have. 48,000 actuators that you have to infer at every step. This only takes 3.5 milliseconds, which is pretty cheap compared to the rest. Also, I was worried that sampling the heights around the robot's base for all the robots together would be very costly. 
but actually something more than half a million um, heights x less than one millisecond so it's basically free in uh, compared to the simulation cost so that was it that was my short presentation uh, thank you for your attention i'm happy to answer all of your questions do we face any problem for transferring the vision sensors from simulation to real so it's not a, a vision sensor we're only providing uh, the heights at these selected points and on the real robot, this comes from a, an elevation map that the robot built with LiDAR inputs. So it's simpler to transfer than uh, a camera inputs, for example. But on the other hand, it is actually the main limitation for the transfer. So whenever this elevation map has unmodeled problems like spikes or drift and things like this, we see that the, the policy struggles a lot. <laughs> 